Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Morris Berman. Morris Berman is well known as an innovative cultural historian and social critic. He's taught at a number of universities in Europe and North America, has held visiting endowed chairs at Incarnate Word College San Antonio, the University of New Mexico, and Weber State University. He's the author of a trilogy on the evolution of human consciousness, The Reenchantment of the World, 1981, Coming to Our Senses, 1989, and Wandering God, A Study in Nomadic Spirituality, 2000. And in 2000, his Twilight of American Culture was named a notable book by the New York Times Book Review. Dr. Berman relocated in Mexico in 2006, and during 2008 and 2009 was a visiting professor at the Tecnologico de Monterrey, Mexico City. In 2015, he published a study of Japan called Neurotic Beauty, and 2016 we'll see the publication of his second novel, The Political Satire, The Man Without Qualities. So before we actually start, um, I just want to mention that uh, so many of your books have been so important to me and also to so many activists and writers I know. Your, your work uh, has had a profound influence on the work of so many people. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and so thank you for your work and thank you for being on the program. And my first question, I think, is so um, – you have drawn some parallels in your work between the current American empire and the collapse of Rome. So I'm wondering if you can if you can talk about that a little bit. Sure. I um you mentioned the trilogy I did on the evolution of human consciousness and then following that I did a trilogy on the uh, collapse of the American empire. And the first of that trilogy was called The Twilight of American Culture that you mentioned. It was published in 2000. And it was in that book in particular that I talk about uh, the factors that um, led to Rome's uh, collapse and how uh, the United States was pursuing the same four factors. Those were present, and <coughs> excuse me, rather than resisting them or trying to reverse them or anything like that, they were actually accelerating. And that um, the handwriting was on the wall unless we did something like that. Uh, one factor that was common to both empires was an increasing divide between rich and poor. Um, as time went on in the Roman Empire, uh, you had this very small, very wealthy class elite at the top and then the large mass of people. And, of course, we saw that, that argument being made by Occupy Wall Street a few years ago, that there was the 1% and the 99%. Actually, if you take the something like the 0.01% of the American population, um, it uh, owns something like 15% of all the wealth. And if you take 1%, it owns something like 47% of the wealth. Recently, I read that the top richest 20 people, 20 in the United States, uh, own more than the bottom 50% of the country, as in wealth, more than 50 bottom, which would be about 160 million people. That's quite interesting uh, kind of statistic, it seems to me. Um, so that, that leads to a situation of massive distrust, political instability, and uh, finally a kind of, you know, a creeping kind of gangrene within the body politic, and that happened to Rome, and it's certainly happening to us. And with each passing month, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Uh, a second factor is the inability to pay one's bills. I mean, we've got a national debt. What is it, 14 trillion? I can't even remember anymore. Every time I check in, it's another trillion higher, and um, we're going broke, basically. I mean, the Chinese own two trillion dollars worth of our securities, and the Japanese one trillion. If they ever called in that debt, the United States would simply collapse. Uh, the reason they don't call in that debt is that they want the, their uh, their interest on their investment. And so for them to call into debt, and that means that they lose, so they don't do it. But if they did, we'd be finished. Um, so this is another factor in, in the sense that we're just going broke, as Rome did. Um, a third factor is what I call spiritual death, that there's a loss of the central idea. Uh, people stop believing in uh, the one the one thing that's holding the thing together in a spiritual sense. In the case of Rome, it was Roman power itself, Senatus Populusco Romanus, SPQR, which appeared on all their standard bearers and so on, that everybody could identify with 
you know, the Roman Republic and later the Roman Empire. But uh, as Rome began to disintegrate and lose wars and so on, um, there was less and less belief in that. And right now, the central idea, of course, in the United States has been the American dream. And that has been uh, severely eroded. You've got, um, I mean, the official statistics, never, you know, uh, never mind the official statistics of unemployment, but the real statistics of unemployment are something like 18%. And one out of five people. And they're not going to find jobs. I mean, 10 years will go by. They're not going to find jobs. Um, it's also the case that the real statistics of poverty or near poverty are something like 40%. You've got 40% of people in this country going to bed hungry. Um, and so the belief that, uh, you know, if you can work hard, you'll get ahead, the, the central idea of the American dream, that your pocketbook, your property, and so on is going to expand, uh, more and more people are starting to see that it doesn't apply to them. It's not going to happen for them. And the fourth factor I mentioned that the two umpires had in common was that as time went on, the population became dumber and dumber. Um, you know, graffiti in ancient Rome, uh, as time went on, began to have misspellings in it. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, there are all kinds of ways that we know leading intellectuals wrote book with books with very poor grammar and syntax. Um, the, uh, the dumbing down uh, in the United States, I mean, I wrote about that in the Twilight book, and I gave various examples of uh, just how stupid Americans were. And since that, since 2000, I, that, that database expanded, and so I wrote more about it in um, the second book in that sequel, which is called Dark Ages America. And it was in 2006. But meantime, people got on the bandwagon. I mean, books appeared with titles like Idiot America or Just How Dumb Are We, in which, you know, statistics after statistics were piled up that Americans don't know anything. I remember being at a um, party in Vermont a few years ago uh, that uh, it was it was a part of an anarch a secessionist conference. Uh, I was going to be speaking at it. It was a party the night before. Um, Thomas Ned, Thomas Naylor's house. He wrote the book Secession. Great guy. And um, he, uh, there was a, a professor from the University of Vermont, or I think it was U UVT. But he said to me, you know, when freshmen come here, when they come here and they're 18 years old, they don't know anything. And when I say they know nothing, I don't mean they know a little. I mean they know nothing. They don't know who Franklin Roosevelt was. I mean they know nothing. So I said to him, well, what do they talk about? What's their conversation? He said, it's about video games. Now, that's among contemporary 18-year-olds. When I was 18 and I graduated uh, you know, high school, I could tell you, you know, the history of the Berlin Wall and stuff like that. I mean, we learned actual stuff, and it was difficult. All that's gone down the drain. Americans really do know nothing, and the statistics of just ignorance and stupidity are so vast that you have to gasp. You, you can't believe some of this stuff. And some of it has appeared on YouTube with interviews. I remember one, some guy had a clipboard and he was standing in front of the women's studies building at uh, UC Santa Barbara. And women were coming out, you know, or going by. And he, was, he said, I've got a petition against women's suffrage. Uh, oh, I'll sign that, of course because they thought suffrage meant suffering. They were taking courses in you know, 19th and 20th century women's history. Coming out, a guy says to them, I've got a petition, will you sign it? It's against women's suffrage. Oh, sure, I'll sign that. Um, this is what we've come to now. <clears throat> so there's, I mean, there's very little, you know, when I say that people that talk about revolution or we're going to turn the declining tra trajectory around, I say, with what raw material? Who, who are the people that you think are going to rise up? They don't have two thoughts in their brain. All they're doing is staring into smartphones. That's their life. And so uh, this is the same. I mean, there weren't any smartphones in Rome that I know of, but there was an equivalent kind of thing, and it was called bread and circuses, panometricensis, where basically you kept the masses busy with gladiatorial shows and combats, uh, and made sure they had enough bread. And this was the way that uh, the lid was kept on things. 
because the population had gotten so dumb. And then we're facing that as well. So you take those four factors, and if that was in 2000, of course, I didn't expect the United States to read my book and say, oh, this guy's Berman is on the right track. Let's do everything he says. Can you imagine the White House saying that? So instead, they just increased and aggravated those four factors. Fifteen years later, uh, these things show up in spades. There is no reversal of this trajectory. Um, and that's why, I'm, as far as the United States goes, I'm not an optimist. I think it's just going to go the way of the Roman Empire and fall apart. And we are witnessing that today. So I want to uh, – and thank you for all that. I want to go back to um, number three of your four categories. And that really reminded me of a quote by Joseph Campbell. You're, and number three, to remind readers – well, instead of me characterizing, can you do a one-sentence – a uh, reminder of number three? Yeah, that it's a spiritual death that takes place. There's the loss of the central idea or the central belief that's been holding the, uh, that particular civilization together, and people no longer have faith in it. Yeah, so, so that reminded me of a quote by Joseph Campbell that was very important to me in my 20s, which is, for those in whom a local mythology still works, there's an experience both of accord with the social order and of harmony with the universe. For those, however, in whom the authorized signs no longer work, or if working produce deviant effects, there follows inevitably a sense both of dissociation from the local social nexus and of quest, within and without for life, which the brain will take to be for meaning. And what I got from that is if the catechism works, or if the you know, confession and all those things of the Catholic Church work for you, you have a path of meaning set out. And the same is true for the American dream. And if they don't work for you, then you're basically on your own trying to figure out how to get some meaning in your life. And so, a lot of people, I think, are a lot of Americans right now are in that category. And so, what does that? What does Joseph Campbell's idea with that is that will set people off on what he called the hero quest, which you know you're you're trying to find meaning in your own life, and you and I think I would agree with your what I seem to be your perspective that. That you seem to be also that that causes a a breakdown of of I mean obviously it causes a breakdown if you no longer believe in the Catholic Church the Catholic Church no longer has the power it once did. Right, that's right, and so slowly the United States is losing that. Um, I think that shows up, for example, in the low voting rates that occur during an election. People don't go because they don't believe that there's much difference between the parties, or more importantly, that any elected party or official can do anything for them. I wouldn't say it puts them on a hero quest. In fact, I would say it puts them on a depressing quest, uh, 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 a feeling of uh, they can't relate to anybody, nobody understands them, they can't find work. It's not a hero quest at all. But um, it nevertheless uh, is a, uh, is a, it's a dislocating kind of thing where you stop believing in, uh, I, I called it vital kitsch in, in the Twilight book. I mean, the last, the July 4th celebration I went to, um, I don't know, 15 more years ago or something like that, I think I was living in Seattle at the time, and it was so hollow. It was, so, it was, it was apparent to everybody how hollow all this was, um, that you're using these old symbols, but the symbols don't have any content anymore. You know, I, lived, I was living in Germany when the wall came down, and one of the things that was very interesting to me was, at that time, if you wandered over um, to the, um, the old Reichstag, the, the Brandenburg Gate, there were tables set up that were selling the artifacts of the Soviet Union. Um, hats with, you know, commissars' hats with red stars in them, and all kinds of trinkets and um, uh, those kind of material that, that, you know, uniforms and so on, that once struck terror in most of the world and certainly in the Soviet population, or at least obedience, um, and it had such power, these symbol, hammer and sickle and so on. And now they were just empty. They had no, it was like looking at a corpse. You know, the spirit had left and you were looking at the detritus of an empire. And I think that's true now for the United States 
as well. Uh, there's a kind of feeling of looking at these pins and flags and stuff like that, and people feel, some people anyway, well, what does this have to do with me? You know, I don't have much in my life. This dream didn't pan out. What does any of this have to do with me? So what did, what were some of the, um, what were some of the unquestioned beliefs that, um, that held the American empire together and that formed the American empire? Like one of the things you talk about, and, and then tie that to why slash how America ended up failing and tie all that to, to what you call the hustling model. Yeah, um, you know, a few years ago, I I published a collection of essays called The Question of Values. And in that collection of essays in particular, I discuss uh, these unconscious programs that have been running the United States and running Americans for a long time. And you call them unquestioned beliefs, or you call them unconscious programs, in the sense that Americans are not really conscious of them but they mouth them all the time, and they say them all the time, and they seem to be running our lives. And I identified uh, four in particular that were very, very strong um, and went back a very long ways. And the first was the notion of what's been called American exceptionalism, that we are guided by providence. We are, you know, John Winthrop's famous line, we're the city on the hill. And as the city on the hill, everybody looks at this gleaming thing, the city on the hill, and it's our mission to spread our way of life because that's what everybody wants. They want uh, American exceptionalism for themselves. They want to be like Americans. And we have believed that, and it has <coughs> excuse me, motivated an awful lot of wars. You know, we're going we're gonna to do a regime change in Iraq, and we're going to ram our model down their throats whether they want it or not. And so we go around the world um, interfering, uh, torturing, violating, killing, uh, in the name of this uh, American exceptionalism that everybody really wants to be like us. And if they don't, they're very misguided. And, uh, you know, I mean, Henry Kissinger, after the, the CIA overthrew Salvador Allende in Chile in 1973, said, we weren't about to let Chile make a mistake. The United States will be the arbiter of what's correct and what's a mistake. And if you're making a mistake, you know, we'll send in the Marines. And so this is the, the first unconscious program that we have a mission. And we're the model of what a society should be. Um, it's very strong. I mean, when, when Americans run around saying we're number one, and we're not we're number one. We're not even number one economically. And in terms of health care, we're number 37 among the industrialized nations. I mean, we're number one in the number of people, percentage of people we incarcerate, uh, you know, 25% uh, or so. I mean, it, it's, it's something, uh, 2 million people, it's something ridiculous. It's more than any other country. Incarcer we're number one in that. But we're not number one anymore. But Americans need to believe that, that you know, that's part of the unconscious programming. Um, the second is that uh, individualism, is where it's at, and group activity is not where it's at. In fact, it may even be communism. So it's the John Wayne figure, the Clint Eastwood figure, that is venerated by Hollywood and the rest of the country, uh, you know, the, the lone guy on the frontier. Um, this is how things get done, by individual will. Horatio Alger stories fed this for many generations. Um, well, Superman, for crying out loud. Yeah, right, exactly, you know, and so everybody's on their own, and, uh, you know, if I can make it here, you can make it anywhere in New York, New York. This is the, the kind of philosophy. I remember reading that uh, since Katrina in 2005, that hurricane, um, the re levees never got repaired, and the reason for that was that Louisiana councilmen or whoever the level, the state level, I guess it was, decided that working together was communistic. And so you, know, you couldn't repair the levees because you had to work together to do it. You know, that's how demented this philosophy is. Um, the third, I said the lone, you know, the lone man on the frontier. It's always a man, of course. Um, the lone man on the frontier. The frontier thesis was that 
is the core of the American dream. That is to say, the goal is expansion. First, it was geographic expansion out to uh, the Pacific Rim, out to the California edge, and then it became um, world expansion, geographical expansion, but also economic expansion, technological expansion, that there are no limits uh, to what you can or should do. And of course, this bangs up against the limits of resources, that there are limits to growth, but growth on this philosophy of the frontier thesis is the purpose of the economy and the individual and so on, even though growth is now the central problem. I mean, it's what's driving climate change and everything else. And the last one was um, the term coined by uh, the last unconscious program, sort of incorporates these three, but it was a term coined by Robert Bella, the late Robert Bella, sociologist at Berkeley. Um, he, it's what he called the civil religion, that although, and this, this was anticipated by other sociologists as well, I have to say. This was 1967 when Bella wrote this essay. Um, but the idea was that although there are Protestants and Muslims and Jews and Catholics and various sects, you know, in the United States, the truth is, for all of them, there is just one religion, if you're an American citizen, and that is the United States itself. In other words, that's what's being worshipped. And that's why there is such a huge, a powerful reaction that the United States is criticized. Um, I've seen this, you know, I mean, people will write into me about their experiences with this being at a dinner party or something like that. And they'll raise an issue that, that is of a fundamental critique of the United States. And people get enraged. Well, I mean, why can't you just disagree and say, well, no, here's my evidence that that's wrong. No, no, they fly into a rage because you have violated my God. That's what's going on. And Bella was right. I mean, it is the civil religion. It doesn't matter what you are. We're all pursuing the American dream. We're all individuals. We all feel that the United States has a mission, that an indefinite expansion is the way to, way to behave in the world, and that's the religion. And if you question that, um, the, the reaction is quite, quite violent, you know. And it's why somebody like Donald Trump can get 41% now of the GOP vote in terms of poll polling uh, because he says we'll make America great again and people hear that they get all excited you know so what what are the implications of those what are the effects of those unconscious beliefs and what what do they apart from what we see what does that lead to well, it got us, all those beliefs got us uh, where we are now. Um, it's not that, incidentally, it's not that these beliefs are entirely wrong. Um, it's good to have pride in your country. It seems to me individual achievement has a positive aspect to it. Growth has positive aspects to it. All this is fine. It's just that taken in an unrestrained way, there's something dialectic where we expanded by 1876, 100 years after the country was founded. The United States was manufacturing one third of the world's manufactured goods. Now that's doing pretty well, you know, for a young nation, 100 year old nation. Now, now it makes one third of all the goods in the world. You know, I mean, that's quite remarkable. Um, but the problem is uh, a dialectical one. That is to say that the very things that lead to growth also are the seeds of your demise if you can't reflect and control it and we never did and <coughs> excuse me this is your earlier question was how does this all relate to why america failed and the problem is that the critique of this model and the critique of what the united states was doing which i call the hustling model i mean it's just basically opportunism and expansion, the critique of that was never allowed to have a voice. That critique began early in the 17th century with the Puritan divines, for example, and it ran through um, people like uh, Lewis Mumford or Emerson and Thoreau or Jane Jacobs, um, down to Jimmy Carter, really, in 1979. That was the last public stance of, of the critique of that model. And 
it never really could get a voice. It could never get any traction. In fact, after Jimmy gave his spiritual malaise speech in Annapolis in July of 1979, a congressman took to the floor the next day to suggest that he was mentally ill. Um, that's how, you know, it, it's everything is shut down. It presents an alternative. Now, the problem with that is that the model, meanwhile, is running, and it's starting to run the country into the ground. And what Jimmy offered at that time was the possibility of self-reflection. He did it from a Christian standpoint. He said, don't look at the uh, look at the beam in your eye, not the moat in your opponent's eye. You know, um, and he was calling for a kind of self-reflection. And you know, I mean, in the case of let's say an individual who feels that his life is not on track and he's depressed all the time or suicidal, and he will go to a therapist. What's the therapist's job? The therapist's job is to allow that person to become transparent to themselves to see who they are and what they're doing because if you want to do any repair work on your your way of life your beliefs um all that stuff that's inside your mind if you want to do any repair work on it you've got to know what it is this is and in alcoholics anonymous they call this step four making a moral inventory you need to look at your character flaws then you can change. You know, then at that point, if you, you decide, well, maybe I shouldn't be drinking all the time, maybe I should become a better person or something like that, you can do something about it. Well, in the case of individuals, I was told that AA has a success rate of about 20%, um, which is better than all the other remedies, apparently. But, you know, 80% choose not to go down that road because it's so difficult. Well, in the case of nations, zero choose to go down that road. And what happens is that you don't let in the critique. Uh, you get completely marginal. Anybody like Thoreau or Emerson and so on that talks in terms of fundamental problems will get marginalized by the society. And so it, the society is not willing to let in precisely that material which could help it. And so that's been uh, in, the, in the third volume of the uh, American Empire Trilogy that I wrote, it's called Why America Failed, in that third volume, basically I say it failed because it simply wouldn't allow alternative voices to be heard, let alone follow what they were talking about. And so it just followed you know, a trajectory that first expanded and now is collapsing. And that's what we're seeing. Um, Obama promised that this was going to be an open administration and that whistleblowers would not be persecuted. Apparently, he has persecuted more whistleblowers than any other president in the history of the country combined. Um, somebody opens their mouth and says, hey, this is a mistake. They lose their job. They get persecuted or prosecuted. That's how the United States is now operating. You know, um, When I wrote, uh, when, when Dark Ages of America was published in 2006, um, this is a classic example, you know. I mean, it received a review in the New York Times that was completely dishonest. It didn't even take into account the contents of the book. Uh, it was a nasty and a dishonest review, and so I wrote a rebuttal of it. And the Times refused to print it. The only place you can read it is on my blog where it's archived. Um, but this was an example of my taking apart uh, this really savage review and showing that it hadn't, the review hadn't even discussed the contents of the book. It just said this is an awful book. Um, what chance did, then do we have for a dialogue if I write a rebuttal and the Times is too cowardly to print it? And they are. They are cowards. This, this all reminds me of a couple things. One of them is that there's a great, a great little paragraph by R.D. Lang about um, the dynamics, the, the three rules of a dysfunctional family, which also apply, I think, to a dysfunctional culture. And rule A is don't. Rule A1 is rule A does not exist. And rule A2 is never discuss the existence or non-existence of rules <laughs> A, A1, or A2. Right. I remember this. I remember and, this. And yeah. so within, within an abusive family dynamic, you can talk about anything you want in the entire world. You can talk about 
bread. You can talk about circuses. You can talk about football. You can talk about America's Got Talent. But you can't talk about the violence you pretend isn't happening. And then on the larger social scale, we can talk about um, how great America is, or we can talk about how America would be even greater if we just made this minor change. But we can't talk about these fundamental critiques or you get slapped down either A, you don't receive grants, B, you don't receive publications, or C, you get trashed in New York Times. You know, whatever whatever forms it is, it will it will conform to that dynamic. And and that actually brings up either do you want to respond to that or do you want me to add there's another question I want to ask. I just too. I just wanted to add one little thing there to that. I remember years ago reading that there was one particular tribe in New Guinea that had a word that uh indicate a word for all the things you were not allowed to say in public. There was a word that um, that that was used to describe all the stuff that's verboten to be said out loud. And then they had a word for uh, describing the activity of saying those things. <laughs> and I thought, well, if they have a word for describing the activity of saying those things, I mean, I guess it's something like whistleblowing. I don't know. But if they have a word for that, it suggests that there's some health in that society in the sense that it's willing to become transparent or willing to hear and entertain uh, an alternative narrative, you know. And uh, the, the, the thing Lang was talking about was that within the family structure, there's an official narrative, and then there's an alternative narrative that people within the family who feel screwed over or persecuted or whatever, abused, have, but they're not allowed to say it, and then extending that to uh, you know a nation at large, there's this whole body of stuff that you're not allowed to talk about, and if you try to do it, the penalties range from, you know, you can't get your rebuttal published in the New York Times, to you're killed. And I want to go back to the whole sort of dumbing down notion. And one of the things I love about everything you're saying here is that it's not, oh, kids these days are stupid. It's that, you know, it's not, it's not like a, you know, you and me being two middle-aged white males grousing about kids these days. But the problems, because you're making the parallel to Rome, the problems, it's, it's a much more radical analysis that this is not a personal problem but instead it is a functional problem that comes at the end of empire and a predictable a predictable and functional problem at the end of empire did you see what i'm trying to get at yeah yeah i i i agree with that it's sort of like there would be you know a way of dismissing what we're saying oh you know we're these two old guys you know white males and they're grousing about kids today. And so, I mean, I've heard that. I've heard people say that of my work and other work and stuff like that. But the fact is that if what we're describing is part of a disintegration of an entire culture, then there are limits to that type of ad hominem critique. And so what does that there's, – there's a quote that I sent you last night by email that I just love by Edward Gibbon. And the reason I love it is because – he is writing in the 1780s, I believe, about something that happened hundreds of years before, but it's applicable today. And it once again makes clear that the problems we're facing aren't really personal, but instead functional and structural. And here's his quote. The five marks of the Roman decaying culture, concern with displaying affluence instead of building wealth, obsession with sex and perversions of sex, art becomes freakish and sensationalistic instead of creative and original, widening disparity between very rich and very poor, and increased demand to live off the state. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah. do, you, do you want to comment? It's okay if you don't. Do you want to comment on that at all? Well, you know, when, when I looked at that, I thank you for sending it to me. And when I looked at it, one of the things that um, came to mind was the work of Pateram Sorokin, who was a Russian sociologist that... Um, immigrated to the United States and wrote a whole series of volumes about um, how civilizations change. And so uh, I can't remember the, the name of the famous series. I, I even have written articles about this, but for some reason I can't remember right now uh, the name of that series. But um, one of the things he, he says is 
that things get inverted. They get um, turned upside down. And so work that is truly creative, which barely happens anymore, is just ignored. And stuff that is kitschy and promotional is hailed as um, uh, culturally advanced. So uh, what do we have now? We have Kim Kardashian, who is a nothing, nothing, um, being exalted as the kind of, some kind of cultural leader. And some university gave Kanye West this uh, award. You know, I mean, things that are really jokes when you, <laughs> when you take a look at what they really are about um, are now taken seriously. And he talks about um, how the people who are really trying to do something for the culture are dismissed as enemies. And the people who are destructive within the culture are exalted as heroes. So, um, you know, George W. Bush, <coughs> excuse me, is regarded as a hero by many. Uh, Chelsea Manning is in jail. Um, Edward Snowden has to, you know, live in exile. Um, the people who are truly heroic are seen as traitors. And they can, so one of the things he's talking about is that in a situation where uh, the, 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 the society, the civilization is dying, there's, there's just a reversal, and um, things get turned upside down. And this is, I think, some of the things that um, Gibbon is talking about as well, that, um, for example, art becomes free, freakish and sensationalistic and rather than creative and original. So I think there's a, an understanding that there's an inversion of values when a, a culture collapses. And the thing I feel bad in particular is that young people get sucked into this. Um, they get sucked into believing the propaganda and to seeing, uh, you know, so living in a world that's upside down, um, where day is night, and for them, it, you know, that's all they know. And um, how do you fight your way out of this? How do you really fight your way out? How do you see, for example, that a figure like Obama is just a shill for the Pentagon and Wall Street, and that he's an empty person who just does whatever the, whatever the wind blows, that's the way he goes and is presiding over a genocidal plutocracy. I mean, how do you get young people to really see that? It's very hard. The only thing that gives me any sort of, I, I, if, if you know my work at all, I don't have much optimism at all. And the only thing that, that, that really does give me any optimism is a line that a friend of mine said a long time ago, which is that lies are very expensive to maintain. And so I think that is one of the reasons I keep writing is, is that I'm sure you've had this too, where, I mean, like, okay, so in 1986 or 87, I was in a library, and a book jumped off a shelf at me. It was Neil Everenden's The Natural Alien, and it was the first book I ever read, and he, by the way, also introduced me to your work. Anyway, that was the first book I ever read that did not take the sort of perspective that the entire world is here for us to use. The first book I ever read that did not take that perspective as a given, and it is not too much to say that that book saved my sanity. And then coming along a couple of years later, you know, reading Coming to Our Senses, is like, oh, a huge weight went off my shoulder. There's a great line by somebody or another that is, in a culture of lies, telling the truth is a great relief. And it, yeah, that's right. how I felt coming across Coming to Our Senses, The Reenchantment of the World. It's like, oh, my God, I'm not crazy. The culture's crazy. That is, And so I think that's one of the counters to these – this, all of these continuous lies is to to simply continue to patiently, patiently, patiently point out point out these lies as you do. For me, that's one of the only only ways we can move forward. Yeah, I I mean I see that as um, you know I mean people ask me how I feel about the futility of my efforts, <laughs> and I say, well, what else am I supposed to do? What should I do with my time? You know, play golf like uh, Jerry Ford. I mean, what is it I'm supposed to do? And um, so I'm just willing to, you know, patiently plod along. And I have heard that kind of response, uh, I have to say, probably now from hundreds of people over the years, that I thought I was nuts until I read such and such a book that you wrote, and suddenly I realized it was the culture. 
And all that's great, and it makes me feel good, obviously. But there is one problem, and that is you're just fishing a few people out of the drink. That's what it amounts to. I would be invited, for example, to address introductory sociology classes or political science classes as a visitor, you know, just one, one, one class and so on. And there were various ways that I approached this kind of thing because uh, I, was, I was aware that 50 people in front of me or whatever the class size was uh, were living underwater. I mean, they were, you know, 19 or 20 years old, and uh, given what that professor at the University of Vermont said, they knew nothing. I mean, I understood that. And so there were various ways I would approach it, but one, one, way I, one thing I would do was write the name Noam Chomsky on the blackboard. And I would say, how many people in this room recognize this name? At the very most, absolute most, it would be two out of 50. And I would say, okay, this is the foremost critic of U.S. foreign policy in the United States. Um, if the fact that 48 of you or 49 of you don't know his name suggests that the media are doing their job, they have seen to it that you will not know this name and that you will not know the things that he says. Uh, I hope that some of you will go home and Google it, see what comes up. I'm guessing nobody did. I'm guessing very few bothered to do that. But this is what I mean. I mean, the kind of thing I'm talking about, I think I could walk into an auditorium of a thousand people, give a lecture, and maybe affect, I don't know, four or five people in the audience. And I'm willing to do it for those four or five because their lives will be a lot different as a result. Um, I recently gave a series of lectures in Chile and at a university, and I was talking about a book of mine called uh, Spinning Straw into Gold. It's a personal memoir, and it talks about authenticity in one's life and finding the true narrative of your life rather than the narrative that society has designed for you. And when I finished, one woman in the audience said, how many people do you think you're going to reach? <laughs> a smart cookie. And I said, uh, very few, less than 1%. Uh, but there's that 1%. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping that uh, some folks of you in the audience will understand what happened, who Salvador Allende was, what happened with the CIA and the overthrow of that democratically elected regime, what the United States did to you. You know, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll look, you'll look at that and you'll understand something about your country, what you want to do with your lives and so on. But I said it may be that very few. I don't know about the situation in Chile, they were very bright people. I can tell you in the United States, I mean, you're talking to people who basically have been lobotomized. And I don't expect to reach very many at all. But as I said, that's what I'm, I know that that's what I'm supposed to do, and so I do it. So I would love to talk about this a lot more, but we have about five minutes left, and I would love for you to talk about, sorry to only do it in five minutes, but to talk about the, the newest books, The Neurotic Beauty and The Man Without Qualities. Yeah, I thank you. I appreciate that, Derek. I wanted to say that Coming to Our Senses, which has been out of print for a while, just reappeared. So if you look it up on Amazon, if you know anybody in the audience here is interested in reading that book, you can do that now. I mean, it's available. And uh, the book I just mentioned... Wait, wait, strong. wait, wait. I also just want to say that people actually should do that. It's, it's actually a fabulous book. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, it was, it was uh, reprinted by a publisher called Echo Point Press that um, reprints what they consider classics um, that have been out of print, and they did this. And um, also, uh, the book that I just mentioned, Spinning Straw into Gold, is currently out of print, but I'm working with um, the folks at uh, Water Street Press to bring it back into print, and I hope sooner or later we'll do that. Water Street Press also published my book on Japan, which is called Neurotic Beauty, and that can be found on Amazon as well. And Neurotic Beauty is a study of um, a cultural analysis of Japan that includes a new interpretation of why the United States dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and also the most controversial aspect of this book, the possibility of Japan as being a model for a post-capitalist uh, world. That's gotten a lot of discussion and play. And then, you know, the last thing, 
was the one you mentioned in your intro, this novel that's coming out called um, The Man Without Qualities. Uh, that's being published by the Oliver Arts and Open Press. should be out late February, I would say. That's what the schedule is. But it's a satire on American politics. I mean, it's a wonderful uh, uh, scene of uh, Hillary going into a total meltdown and becoming a going viral, you know, on YouTube and ending her career. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Um, but um, it's, uh, it, I hope it's funny. <laughs> I hope people find it funny. Anyway, that's what's on the agenda for me, anyway. Well, I would, once again, like to thank you for your work and to like to thank you for being on the program. And then I would like to, to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Morris Berman. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.